on this edition of Great Lakes Now, mapping the bottom of the Great Lakes in amazing detail. Gives us very high resolution imagery of any different seafloor types, any wrecks, obstructions, or other points of interest on the bottom. A lending library of fish. We have databases that tell us where in this vast collection every single specimen is located. And news from around the Great Lakes. This program is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. The Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan, from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future, to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. The Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at DPTV the Polk Family Fund, and viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ward Detweiler. Welcome back to Great Lakes Now. If you're a regular viewer, you've probably seen the work of David Ruck, who has shot and produced a number of segments for us over the years. In this next segment, David steps out from behind the camera to tell you about a new high-tech effort to map the bottom of the lakes. NOAA's survey vessel, the Thomas Jefferson, is a purpose-built survey machine and the last time a vessel of this capability graced the Great Lakes was around four decades ago. The Jefferson, along with a flotilla of other craft, are charting the details of the Great Lakes bottomlands in unprecedented detail. It's all part of an effort to update navigational charts used by mariners across the region, a priority of NOAA's Office of Coast Survey. Today, the Jefferson is charting areas around Cleveland, called approaches, critical to navigation in the Great Lakes economy. Got to get your sea legs ready. It's a little choppy out there today. Patrick Osborne captains one of the small vessels, or launches, attached to the Thomas Jefferson, right. also called the TJ. Today it's my water taxi, but it's usually used to conduct sonar surveys of the lake bottom. Hydrographic survey is taking technology and mapping the bottom of the ocean floor to get appropriate or proper depths so that ships can pass without causing damage to their vessels. This launch gives us the capability to push further inshore to conduct hydrographic survey operations away from our larger ship. We're gonna pull up alongside it and they're gonna latch into the boat that we're on and actually pull us up into the air and onto the deck of the boat. Whoa, hook it up! Commander Matthew Juskowski of the NOAA Corps leads a crew of around 30 aboard the Jefferson. Ocean mapping is our main primary goal. We're updating the nautical charts, the maps that the mariners use uh, to navigate from one port to the other. What's different about those in terms of the technology that was used to make those maps versus what you're doing today? The data that we used to make those maps are quite old, and it's a, it's a question of resolution. While current navigational charts of the Great Lakes have aided navigation for decades, they're based on a patchwork of data gathered using primitive survey methods, like lead line surveys, in some cases around 80 years ago, indicating only depths, often miles apart. The data gathered by the Thomas Jefferson represents a giant leap forward in resolution. Sonar and advanced computing will create charts that are both internationally standardized and highly detailed. Erin Saraki is the chief survey technician aboard the Thomas Jefferson. Her team ensures that the data they collect is clear and accurate. And to do that, they rely on two main pieces of survey equipment. So we are currently on the main deck of the ship um, underneath one of our hydrographic survey launches. In this black mounting box, we have the multi-beam sonar. That one is the one that's actually giving us the soundings that we put on the chart, how deep the water is. And then beside it, the long torpedo shape, that is our side scan sonar, but it gives us very high resolution imagery of any different seafloor types, any wrecks, obstructions, or other points of interest on the bottom. The equipment that's on here, maybe the scale is a little bit different, but it's pretty much the same as what's on the Thomas Jefferson itself. So actually the multi-beam system, it is identical. So we have th that same exact setup in the hull of the ship. Um, but we also have a second multi-beam system that is much, much larger on the ship. Um, it just works at a different frequency. While the side scan sonar on the launches is attached to their hull, the TJ uses a different configuration. And it looks like a torpedo, but it's actually called a towfish. 
So this is not a weapon. <laughs> it, this is not a weapon, <laughs> even though it looks like one. This is our ship side scan, just a lot bigger. Um, this is the one that gives us the high resolution imagery of the seafloor. So we deploy this off the back of the ship in its, in its tow point, and then we have a control in the survey station to control the winch. We can let cable out to get it down to depth, and then we can bring cable in to bring it up. Water temperature greatly impacts the way sound travels through the water column, and if it's not taken into account, the returns from the sonar can give misleading results. To overcome this, the ship uses what's called a moving vessel profiler, or MVP, which captures the range of temperatures between the hull of the ship and the bottom. This information is vital to getting a clear picture of the bottom of the lake. By factoring in the temperature profile of the water column, the survey team can adjust and correct the vision of the multi-beam sonar, almost like a mathematical pair of prescription glasses. At the heart of the Thomas Jefferson is its acquisition station, where all of the sonar data comes to life on a series of displays in real time. One monitor shows the readings from the multi-beam sonar. So this is the track of our vessel. The color that you see on either side is the actual swath from the multi-beam. This is what, what they refer to as a seabed image, essentially a backscatter image intensity of return. And then this is more of like a, a three-dimensional view. Another monitor shows the image from the side scan, which is so detailed it almost looks like a photograph. It's looking out to either side yeah. in kind of this like wide triangle pattern. Uh -huh. Right now you've got a bird's eye view. Surveys 80 years ago would give us a general sense of the depth of the lake, but these high-definition sonar surveys are even giving us snapshots of the lake's history. And it looks like, in this case, there's some sort of feature. Yes, yep. I mean, it's pretty obvious that it's a wreck of some kind. Lake Erie had the Battle of Lake Erie. Mm -hmm. and you guys are going to be doing some work in areas where stuff like that took place. Is there a chance that the information that you're collecting could help solve some questions about the way the Battle of Lake Erie unfolded? Sure it could. How and where and to whom that information gets released is up to the historical preservation societies. All of this information is passed through NOAA's hydrographic branch before it becomes public. That process begins with Peter Holmberg, a physical scientist with NOAA, who's reviewing information gathered by Aaron's team. He brought something strange up on the screen that he wanted me to see. You've brought something up on the screen here that you wouldn't necessarily expect to find at the bottom of one of the Great Lakes. A couple of people have seen these before me and I saw more of them last night. These 18 meter diameter rings. Uh, I drew a subset over it. And so over in the other window here in subset editor, you can see it in 3D. It's maybe sticking up about a tenth to two tenths of a meter. So it's certainly not anything that it's, that's a hazard to navigation, which is good, but it is really curious. Curious indeed, and it could end up being more than just a curiosity. On a survey in Lake Huron in the early 2000s, researchers discovered sinkholes peppered around Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Further exploration revealed these wild environments had their own chemistry and were home to ancient life forms like purple and white cyanobacteria. The sinkholes are helping scientists learn what Earth was like billions of years ago and teaching us what we might look for as we explore Jupiter's moon, Europa. What we learn from the Great Lakes could inform how we explore space. Could these mysterious rings be another discovery like that? Only time will tell. You're updating those charts, mm -hmm. but then occasionally along the way you come across a shipwreck. Yes. You come across something like this. Right. It sounds like there's a lot of mystery even <laughs> to something as seemingly benign as the bottom of the Great Lakes. Yeah, there is a lot of mystery to it. The Great Lakes, only about 5 to 15 percent of the lake bed has been mapped to modern standards. The nature of the work that we're doing reaches far beyond just safety and navigation. The data that we're collecting has a lot of other uses from habitat mapping, natural resource protection or management of exploitation, coastal development, coastal ecosystem management. There's a lot of different uses for this and one of the biggest things that we get out of this is that the Great Lakes are big, they're deep. Uh, we don't know what we're going to find when we start poking around with these high resolution sonars and that's the one of the more exciting things about this is that the things that you don't know tend to be the most exciting things to learn later on. I, for one, can't wait to see what's discovered along the way. For more about mapping and sailing the Great Lakes, visit greatlakesnow.org. 
The Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto is the largest museum in Canada. We recently got a behind the scenes tour of one of their less public collections. The Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, often called the ROM, is Canada's largest museum. The museum's collections include more than 13 million artworks, cultural objects, and natural history specimens, featured in 40 gallery and exhibition spaces. The museum's holdings also include one of the largest collections of fish in the world. But you won't find it here. In fact, we can't show you the collection's exact location, or even show you the building it's housed in. Because of both security and safety concerns, the collection's exact location is kept secret. Let's just say it's within a two-hour drive of Toronto. Nathan Lujan is the museum's associate curator of fishes. So here we've got a jar going back to 1939, a few darter specimens. A curator of fishes oversees what's behind me, and that is the collection of fishes here at the ROM. Yeah, these ribbon fishes uh, have a really bizarre looking body and head. So the fish collection at the Royal Ontario Museum is one of the top 10 fish collections in North America. It has 110,000 jars of fishes going back over 100 years. This collection functions like a library. Get the label out here, it should tell us where it was collected from the Detroit River, Fleming Channel. Really beautiful little catfish. Each jar behind me contains one or more individuals of a single species collected at a single time at a single place. And that's important because it provides a historical record of biodiversity. And then we have databases that tell us where in this vast collection every single specimen is located. So with a quick search of the database, we can identify where a single jar is and, and find it pretty quickly. Okay. Early, would you like gloves? I would love gloves. Okay. <laughs> the fish in the collection come from all over the world and from the waters that are closer to home. This is a flathead catfish. We used to see them occasionally in the Great Lakes. We have about 50,000 jars of fishes just from the Great Lakes. That collection provides us an understanding of the history of biodiversity in this region. Originally intended for use by students at the University of Toronto, today the collection is used by researchers from around the world. Researchers can come and look at the specimens here on site, or they can request them on loan, and we can send those specimens to them wherever they happen to be working in the world. This is the label that comes directly from Access. Right. I like to see the length. Yep. Because sometimes I'm looking for a really small fish. Before Nathan took over, Erling Holm curated the Royal Ontario Museum's fish collection for more than 44 years. And I retired in March this year. In nearly four and a half decades, did Erling see all the specimens in the collection? Oh, absolutely not. There's uh, over one and a half million specimens of fish. I'm not sure how many I've looked at, but, uh, well, maybe a few hundred thousand anyways. Erling is one of the authors of The ROM Field Guide to Freshwater Fishes of Ontario, which was created based on the fish in the collection and includes information on every species of freshwater fish found in the province. First edition was published in 2009, and it probably took us four or five years. We have information on feeding, on habitat, and on reproduction. And then there is a chart of sizes, maximum sizes, and, and then it lists the similar species that you can confuse it with, <laughs> and, <laughs> and weights. So let's lift the lid and put it on top of that other tank. Okay. Here's my favorite specimen in the collection. This is a South American armored catfish. Yeah, none of these are scales, so catfishes generally don't have scales, but this family of catfishes, the Lorcreidae, has evolved armored plates instead of scales. So these are bony plates that cover the body. The oldest specimen in the collection was jarred more than 150 years ago. And the process of collecting and preserving fish hasn't changed much since then. First, of course, 
all of the fish had to be caught. After that, the fish were euthanized and preserved. The fishes, after being euthanized, were fixed in formaldehyde, basically an embalming fluid. And after that fixation process, it becomes very challenging to get any kind of DNA information. That's the cut side. So we separately will take a fin clip or a muscle tissue and put in a little vial of ethanol that preserves the DNA. After fixing, fish don't stay in formaldehyde. We bring them back here, we rinse them out briefly, and then put them into 70% ethanol. Yeah, this is drinking grade alcohol. I don't think it would taste very good. The formalin fixes them so that the tissues is hard and it doesn't decompose. But if you don't put them in ethanol, then you can get mold forming on them. Ethanol is a real problem, 70% ethanol, because it's a fire hazard. And so this is the reason actually we moved off site here. They didn't want a fire hazard like that in the basement of the ROM. There's a fire suppression system in place, but it's there to prevent the collection from going up in smoke. Many people in the room had better move fast. Masses amount of carbon dioxide will get injected into the room if a smoke alarm goes off. The room becomes totally unbreathable and you gotta get out very quickly. We'd have 10 seconds to get out of the room and completely extinguish any fires. One of the most important roles of natural history museums like the ROM is to house the type collections, which are the foundation of species identification. For every species that any biologist has described, they have to have designated a single specimen or group of specimens as the representative, as the archetype of that species. And that is really the infrastructure, the bulwark behind our understanding of biodiversity on Earth. And those are the first specimens in the event of a fire we'd be jumping in to save and pull out. For fish lovers, the collection may be fascinating, but it also raises an obvious question. Can't we get this knowledge without killing so many fish? We all love the live fish better seeing them in nature, but these specimens are waiting for research and they're a permanent record of the biodiversity of the past. If you take a photograph of a bird, you probably know what species it is and you can have the data of when it was collected and where it was collected. And maybe that's sufficient for some research, but there's a lot that's lost with that. And especially with fishes where there are lots of species that are distinguishable from each other only by minute differences in the teeth inside the jaw. So you, you would just never be able to get that kind of detail with a photograph. Technological advances also provide new opportunities for researchers to gain even more knowledge from collections. So for example, right now, a lot of my work is using CT scanners. So this medical technology that has given us a window into human anatomy is now being used to look at these specimens. And without damaging the specimen, we can look into the morphology and the anatomy on the inside of the fish and see all kinds of surprises like what their last meal was and little characteristics of the skull and the, the skeleton that tell us about their evolution, that tell us about their ecology. And it's just a, a wealth of information. Those specimens have unlimited chapters to tell that a photograph just would not allow us to delve into. For more about Great Lakes fish and Great Lakes museums, visit greatlakesnow.org. And now it's time for the catch, which takes you around the Great Lakes to hear from reporters about the issues they're covering. Some people call these fireflies and others call them lightning bugs, but whatever you call them, they're in trouble. Jenny Whitten, climate change reporter at the Daily Herald, has been looking into the dimming of the lightning bug population. 40% of all insects um, around the country are in danger of extinction, and that includes fireflies. So there are a lot of reasons for that, but one of those is climate change, and that's why I decided to take a deeper look into it. Based on her research, Jenny says the insects are in decline for three main reasons. One of those is habitat loss, and that is driven by climate change. The next culprit is light pollution. It might seem kind of intuitive if you really think about it. Lightning bugs communicate with their light. So when we have more light pollution, it's harder for them to connect with one another and to continue mating and driving up that population. 
And Ginny says the final factor is pesticide use. Pesticide use both individually by homeowners, but also in large scale agriculturally. That is another thing that is driving down the lichen bug population. Part of that is actually, it's quite interesting. So the larvae of lightning bugs actually live in the soil and they're also carnivorous. So if you use pesticide on the soil, not only are the larvae of the lightning bugs at risk, but their food source is also at risk. Jenny says it's important to remember that these issues are affecting the overall insect population. And if you think we're better off with fewer bugs, think again. The reasons why scientists are so concerned about this is because everything is part of a greater food web. And if there are no insects, as a result, there are no birds and it continues down that chain. So one of the things that is a solution that people are really looking at is widespread conservation. There are things you can do to help in your own yard. One of them is letting parts of the yard get a little bit overgrown because that's where these insects really thrive. So don't use as much pesticides. I would say abstain from pesticides in those areas. Don't mow as often. The second thing is making sure that your lights that you use aren't as bright or maybe they're on a sensor so they're not on all the time distracting the fireflies. And the last thing and one of the most important things you can do is planting native plants in your yard because that's really where these insects thrive. In Syracuse, New York, reporter Glenn Coyne has been covering a story about the return of 1,000 acres to the Onondaga Nation. For the Onondaga Nation to get land back is a huge step for them. They once had land across central New York, uh, all of it taken from them by uh, treaties in New York State. And for years they have fought to get land back unsuccessfully. And so this 1,000 acres that they now are getting um, is, a, is a tremendous uh, start for them to, to regain some of their territory. The land transfer happened as part of a settlement between New York State and Honeywell International, one of the companies responsible for polluting Onondaga Lake. As part of the lake cleanup, which started decades ago, Honeywell had to not only clean up the lake, but also basically restore the public's use that was lost during the time the lake was polluted. Honeywell's cleanup is complete and the land transfer is supposed to happen by March. In the meantime, Glenn says Honeywell is responsible for implementing a number of projects to improve the area. The idea behind this is that the land will stay relatively pristine. The Onondaga want it that way. The state has put what's called a conservation easement on the property, which means it has to remain essentially wild. There will be some public access projects, trails and parking lots, but they'll be relatively small scale, just enough to kind of get people into it. Glenn says that the 1,000 acres returned to the Onondaga is one of the largest land transfers made to an indigenous nation in the United States. And it's the first time that land has been returned directly to a tribal entity in the state of New York. This could be the start of other lands given back to, to Indian nations in New York State, but I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. In Cleveland, a new bulk freighter is making waves in Great Lakes shipping. Great Lakes Now's Lake Erie contributor James Prophet has the story. It was just launched a few months ago and made its inaugural visit to Cleveland, where it will service two major Cleveland corporations. The ship was commissioned by Cleveland-based Interlake Steamship Company and is named after company president Mark W. Barker. It is the first American-made bulk cargo carrier constructed uh, on the Great Lakes in about 36 years. The ship can move the same amount of materials as 250 railroad cars or 1,000 tractor trailer loads. But at 639 feet long, it's smaller than some other Great Lakes freighters. This allows it to maneuver more easily. The operators hope it will be able to navigate rivers and tighter dock locations without the aid of tugboats. The Barker is also more environmentally friendly than many older freighters. The Barker meets all the latest US EPA Tier 4 emissions requirements, 
meaning it will burn ultra low sulfur fuel and the engines and diesel generators also are designed to create far less nitrogen oxide, particulate matter, and hydrocarbons emissions. James says the ship will move throughout the Great Lakes transporting bulk cargo like road salt, iron ore, and coal, along with food commodities and large machinery. The Barker will definitely set a precedent in Great Lakes bulk shipping, not only for its modern computer controls, its size, and its ability to get essentially into any port, but its ability to haul not just bulk cargo, but a variety of products, including wind turbines, large machinery, structural items, and even containers. Thanks for watching. For more on these stories and the Great Lakes in general, visit greatlakesnow.org. When you get there, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter to get updates about our work. See you out on the lakes. This program is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. The Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan, from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future, to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. The Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at DPTV. The Polk Family Fund, and viewers like you. Thank you.